With that said, Isaiah 63. What comes to mind when you hear the word steadfast? What does it mean to be steadfast? Well, according to Merriam-Webster's online dictionary, steadfast means, and I quote, firmly fixed in place, immovable, not subject to change. It can also mean firm in belief, determination, or adherence, synonym loyal. When I think of steadfast, uh, my own thoughts, what comes to my mind is an unwavering, constant devotion and perseverance to someone or something, no, no matter what the circumstances. It, it's a never give up, keep going, keep believing, keep at it, get the job got done kind of complete commitment. That's, that's what comes to my mind. Who comes to your mind as you hear what steadfastness is? Who comes to your mind as an example of steadfastness? And maybe you can think throughout history, and maybe you can even think from, you know, literature or fiction, you know, stories, movies. I mean, there's been lots of examples of people that are steadfast. What does it mean to have a steadfast love? What well, would mean that, that the kind of steadfast determination, dedication, complete commitment, loyalty, the unchanging, immovable, and firm nature are applied to loving someone. This morning, as we come to chapter 63 in our series in Isaiah, we see mention made of God's steadfast love. And in many places in Scripture, God's love is described as a steadfast love. So, for example, just this week, I, you know, I've been working my way through Psalms as part of my quiet time, and just this week, I'm reading some of the Psalms, and I come across Psalm 59, which at the end says this. But I will sing of your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. For you have been to me a fortress and a refuge in the day of my distress. O oh, my strength, I will sing praises to you. For you, O oh God, are my fortress, the God who shows me steadfast love. And I thought, that's cool, God. Uh, I'm teaching on steadfast love this week and just working my way through the Psalms and I come across those uh, a couple of verses that, that repeat the phrase twice. God's steadfast love is a covenantal love demonstrated with complete commitment, loyalty, faithfulness, mercy, and compassion. The steadfast love of God is unchanging, it's immovable, and it's firm. God is determined and dedicated in his steadfast love, and it is directed towards his people, those who are rightly related to him. Sadly, despite this steadfast love of God, many people reject it. Others do receive it, but so often those who receive it, perhaps even you and me, can sometimes quickly forget it. Sometimes we can struggle to believe it. Sometimes we struggle to apply it. Sometimes we fail to be transformed by it. What is your response to God's steadfast love you know, hearing about God's steadfast love just here in my introduction this morning, would, would you say that God's steadfast love has and does impact your life? What is your response? How does it impact you? Well, Isaiah 63 verses 1 through 14 can help you as you consider your response because we learn more about God's steadfast love this morning. So let's pray, and then let's look at what God tells us about his steadfast love here in Isaiah 63 verses 1 through 14. God, thanks for including this in your word. You have a purpose for every portion of scripture. And we've seen you teach us some amazing things in our series in Isaiah. And as we are coming towards the end in the final few chapters here, as we get to chapter 63 here in this first two-thirds of the chapter, we see, again, some incredible truths about you and about your steadfast love towards us. So teach us. Teach us your ways, O Lord, that we might walk in your truth. Unite our heart to fear your name. Transform our lives by the power of your spirit, love, grace, and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Isaiah 63, 1 through 14, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Who is this who comes from Edom? In crimson garments from Basra, he who is splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. 
Why is your apparel red and your garments like his who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood splattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption had come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled, but there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought me salvation, and my wrath upheld me. I trampled down the peoples in my anger. I made them drunk in my wrath, and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has granted us, and the great goodness to the house of Israel, that he has granted them according to his compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he said, surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. And he became their savior. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he turned to be their enemy and himself fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old of Moses and his people. Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherds of his flock? Where is he who put in the midst of them his Holy Spirit, who caused his glorious arm to go at the right hand of Moses, who divided the waters before them to make for himself an everlasting name, who led them through the depths? Like a horse in the desert, they did not stumble. Like livestock that go down into the valley, the Spirit of the Lord gave them rest. So you led your people to make for yourself a glorious name. Let's look at the details of this chapter on God's steadfast love under two headings, the future and the past. We see the future described in chapter 63, verses 1 through 6. We see the past past described in chapter 63, verses 7 through 14. First, related to God's steadfast love is the future, verses 1 through 6. What we see in this first section is a detailed depiction of a future coming of God's righteous wrath and just judgment upon those who reject God and are not rightly related to him. This might make you wonder, how is this connected to God's steadfast love? We're we're going to see that it has everything to do with God's steadfast love. This first section relates to what God is going to do in the future on a final day of judgment. So let's unpack this section in verses 1 through 6 and look at the details. Now, to understand this first part of chapter 63, it's helpful to remember what God said in chapter 62, particularly verses 6 through 7. So maybe flip back to chapter 62 if you have your Bibles open or just look with me here on the screen. One of the illustrations God used in chapter 62 that we saw last week is of watchmen on a city wall there in verses 6 and 7. Watchmen on a city wall was used in verses 6 and 7 to tell of God prompting people to pray and that the praying people are to be like watchmen. Remember, we we saw last week that God says, I'm not going to keep silent. You know, he's, he's committed to carrying out his purposes of salvation. And then we saw that he prompts people to pray. Uh, for the accomplishment of his purposes to be, and, and he describes them as being like watchmen on a wall. It, it's, a, it's a great illustration that they were very familiar with in that time because cities had walls and people were very familiar of the role of the watchmen. And I mentioned last week, watchmen were people who would diligently be looking out from the wall, you know, to see if there were any threats coming towards the city, usually like an enemy army of some sort that might try to invade. And if the watchman saw a threat, which typically would be an enemy army, foreign nation coming, they would sound an alarm, muster the troops, and the soldiers would come, and the city would prepare with defensive positions to defend their city. Chapter 63 begins with a question, and, and which may which we come to realize is being asked by one of the watchmen on the wall. And the dialogue gets interesting because what we see is the watchman interacting with someone that the watchman sees. Even though the initially sees them far away, 
we're, we're let in on this almost like conversation that occurs. So there's a little bit of a back and forth here. And we'll try to unpack it here as we go through the details. But the watchman on the wall sees not an enemy army approaching, but rather an individual person coming towards the city. And so the watchman asks, who is this? While this person approaches the city, the watchman sees that he comes from the direction of Edom and Basra. Basra was the capital city of Edom. And, and that he has crimson, meaning red, colored garments. This individual is dressed in splendid apparel, apparel, and this individual marches in the greatness of his strength. There is a power and authority evident to the watchman, even from afar. Who is this? What might be significant, what, what is it significant about coming from Edom? Well, Edom was a nation of people who were descendants of Esau. You might recall there was Jacob and Esau. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated, right? Got in the sense that God chose Jacob. Hated in the sense that he did not choose Esau. There was strife between the two brothers. At one point, um, you know, Jacob feared for his life from Esau. And historically, the Edomites were descendants of Esau, and historically, they ended up being enemies of Israel. So much so that Edom typically typified opposition to Israel and to God. Edom represents, as scholar J. Alec Moyer writes, and I quote, the embodiment of ceaseless animosity against the Lord and his people. Pastor and scholar Ray Ortland Jr. very similarly writes, Edom hated Israel so bitterly that in the prophetic worldview, that nation became more than a nation. It became the epitome of malice toward God and his people. In other words, Edom represents the human being at its worst, despising God, finding itself in earthly joys, and persecuting God's people because of their loyalty to a higher world. So Edom is almost used very, almost metaphorically here. You know, just to, just to kind of give you a, a similar time, similar uh, example of this, as we've gone through out Isaiah, we've seen that Babylon sometimes represents literal Babylon, but Babylon is a phrase, even in Revelation, that's sometimes used just of general worldly opposition to God and of evil. And so Edom, very similar here, is in, in that same sense. Furthermore, what's interesting is the Hebrew word for Edom sounds like the Hebrew word for crimson garments. There's some real, it, it, it almost sounds identical. And, and it gets even more interesting, the capital city, Basra, has a meaning of vintage, a term associated with wine. So who is this one coming from Edom, from Basra, in red garments, in splendid apparel, and marching in great strength? That's what the watchman asked. Well, at the end of verse 1, the individual approaching the city gives an answer. He answers the watchman who sees him coming. He says, it is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Take note of that. The emphasis of what he states relates to his power, but also to his power to save. Suddenly we realize this is not any individual. This sounds like someone we've read about earlier in Isaiah. It sounds like the servant from the four servant songs. Remember the servant songs, Isaiah 42, Isaiah 49, Isaiah 50, Isaiah 52, 53. It sounds like the anointed one we read about in Isaiah 61. We ponder, as the watchman does here in verse 1, who is this? Who is this? The watchman hearing then ask a second question, verse 2. Why is your apparel red and your garments like his who treads in the winepress? The watchman is wondering, and he even asks why. Why this guy looks like he just came from crushing grapes like he's making wine in the winepress? Your garments are all red. Which indicates it wasn't like a completely red shirt or something or a red robe. It was splattered with, you know, 
little spots of red, and sections with a lot of red, maybe. Almost like, you know, we get, you know, if you paint your house sometimes and you just kind of splatter paint on your, hopefully you're wearing an old shirt or something, right? He asks, why are your garments red like you've been, you know, crushing grapes for making wine? And the Lord answers the watchman, making it clear that his red garments aren't red because he's been crushing grapes. And what's on his garments isn't wine at all. What is it then? Look with me at verse 3. What he tells the watchman, this one who is mighty to save, says this, I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood splattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. His garments are red with blood. The metaphor of crushing grapes in the wine press is now being used to describe God crushing not grapes, but people in his anger and his wrath. And the result is, is that their blood has splattered and stained his garments. All of a sudden, this sounds like something out of a horror movie. This person continues telling the watchman more, verse 4, for the day of vengeance was in my heart and my year of redemption had come. This verse with the phrase, the day of vengeance, depicts what the Bible elsewhere so often refers to as the day of the Lord. That is the day of final judgment. It's a future final judgment at the end of the age. The day of the Lord, the day of vengeance, is when God will justly judge and exercise his righteous wrath on all sin, on all evil, and on all people who have rejected God and his steadfast love. Yet with this day of the Lord, verse 4 also tells us there is something else involved. Don't miss this. Something else is stated here. It's referred to as a year of redemption. Vengeance and redemption are connected. They go together. They are like two sides of a coin. For a person gets either vengeance from God or a person gets the other side of the coin, redemption. Vengeance is described as being like a day, relatively short period of time, while redemption is described as being like a year, a relatively long period of time. In fact, redemption will be eternal. Verse 5, the Lord says, I looked, but there was no one to help. Now, in your Bible, if you have it open, peek back to Isaiah 59, verses 16 and 17. I don't have a slide for this one, but I'll kind of summarize it if if you can just follow. But but if you might want to peek back and look at it. In Isaiah 59, verses 16 and 17, God surveyed the situation of his people who were stuck in their sinfulness, and he states there this, there was no man... No one to intercede. So the Lord continues and says, with his own arm, he will bring salvation. Okay? Now go back to our verse here in 63, and he's essentially saying the same thing here in verse 5. No one else can redeem. No one else is mighty to save. No one else can help. And God is appalled at the sin and the state of his people, so his own arm brought salvation, and his wrath upheld him. Notice again, salvation's mentioned, but mentioned with it is wrath. The two go together, and those are synonymous terms. Salvation synonymous with redemption, wrath synonymous with vengeance. The two are going together. But what does it mean here when God says his wrath upheld him? That's an interesting statement. Well, remember, God is a God of righteousness. He's a God of holiness. Isaiah 6, when Isaiah has a vision of the throne room of God, he's saying, woe is me, I'm ruined. I'm a sinful man. I live among a people of unclean lips. And, you know, I'm sinful. And, you know, the seraphim comes, take a coal from the altar, touches his lips, and, and he's cleansed. But God is so holy that usually people's response to 
even the angel of the Lord showing up was to fall on their faces and say, woe is me. And even Peter, when he's with Jesus in the, sh- in the, in the boat fishing, and Jesus says, throw out the nets, and they reel in a whole slew of fish, and he says, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men now. The, Peter's response is, Lord, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. Because he realized he was in the presence of someone holy, and he goes, I, I'm not, compared to you, I'm not. I fall way short of that. God is a God of righteousness, holiness, and love. God loves people. He loves people so much. He loves all of his creation. He cherishes everything that's good, righteous, and true. And yet, when people, when our world, when his creation has been marred by evil sin and opposition and rejection to God, it appalls him, it grieves him, it angers him. Why? Because he loves the objects of his creation. And look, if he didn't love, he wouldn't care. But because he loves so much, he cares, and anger is stirred, and wrath is stirred, and there's a desire for justice, and and there's this plan and purpose of God to put an end to evil sin and all opposition to him justly. Because God loves and because there is evil sin and rejection of him, God in his righteousness exercises justice, justice and he justly judges. He trods the winepress. But even in this, he's judging evil enemies of God, which is also connected to loving and redeeming those who are his people. God brings justice and makes everything right, and part of this is dealing with the wicked while also saving those who turn to him for forgiveness and receive his love and are made righteous. So God's wrath upholds It upholds his good and righteous standards and his will, and it's part of his purposes of salvation. Verse 6 continues describing what he's he's doing. He tramples down the peoples in his anger. He, He makes them drunk on his wrath, which is just a way of illustrating that they receive his wrath in full. Often wrath is depicted as drinking a cup of wrath. And it's as if they're drinking an excessive amount of it, a, a very substantial amount of his wrath in a way that it's as if they were drunk. Meaning it's just a metaphor for they've taken his wrath in full. And look, it says their lifeblood has been poured out on the earth. Who is this then? Who is this who does this? We stated earlier that it sounds like the servant mentioned earlier in Isaiah, the Messiah who is to come, the one who is to be the light to the nations, who brings salvation to the end of the earth. It sounds like the anointed one we saw of Isaiah 61 just two weeks ago, the one who brings good news, the one who binds up the brokenhearted, the one who proclaims liberty to captives. Don't miss this. The one who proclaims the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Again, what's connected? Favor and vengeance, salvation and wrath. Redemption and salvation. And also the one who comforts all who mourn. If it sounds like this individual to you, it's because it is. What we have in these first six verses of Isaiah 63 is a depiction of how this servant, this anointed one, comes to save. But as he comes to save, he will also come to justly judge. This section of Isaiah 63 is a vision of the future. It tells us what is to come when God will bring about the day of the Lord. There will be a final judgment. All sin, all evil, all wickedness, and all who reject God, all who refuse to turn to him and trust him, will be the recipients of this cup of wrath They will be the recipients of this vengeance and righteous wrath, and it is disturbingly described as blood splattering his garments. Revelation 19 depicts this future day of vengeance as well. When Jesus will come, when Jesus comes again. And and as I read this, notice the parallels of Revelation 19 with the very prophecy of Isaiah 63 that we've read and are working through this morning. I have it on the screen for you as well. I've I've, I've not included all of Revelation verses chapter 19, 11 through 16, but the majority of it. Listen with me as I read. Picking up in verse 11 of Revelation 19, the apostle John seeing a vision 
sees this. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty." On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Who is this? His name's Jesus. Is this severe? Absolutely. But it's also connected to God's steadfast love. How? God shows his steadfast love in the severity of his just judgment. He takes sin and evil seriously. He takes our sin seriously. He takes our rebellion and rejection of him seriously. And he warns us here of the realities of not being right with him. And this ought, this ought to prompt us to take seriously what it means to turn to him and trust him for ourselves and for others. We see how desperately we need God's love and forgiveness to get us out of this situation that we are stuck in in our sin and to spare us from this day of vengeance that we all deserve. We see how we need this mighty one himself to save us with his own arm. We need the one who alone can save us, alone can redeem us, who alone can make us right with God. We need the servant, we need the anointed one, we need this Messiah, we need this Jesus. We can also see here in this first section how this day of judgment is necessary. How so? Well, let, let's think about it. If there's no day of vengeance, it would be tempting to think for each of us and for people that we know, for other people to think, does what we do even really matter? And it would tempt us to think if if sin and evil, if there's no day of judgment, then there's really no consequences. There's no justice. It doesn't really matter what we do. And, and, and to take it even further, why would we really even need God then? We don't need to be rescued or spared from anything because there's not any consequences. That, that would be the tempting thought. So we might think, and other people might think, that we don't really need God, we don't really have to face any consequences, so we might as well do whatever we want. Whenever we want, however we want. But the day of vengeance is real, and it is coming. And the day of vengeance then very seriously shows us how desperately we need God, and we need his steadfast love, and that there is consequences to how we live our lives. Lastly, the reality of the day of vengeance helps us to see that God is going to bring justice and, righteous and make, righteousness and make everything right. The, the reality of the Lord treading the winepress of the wrath of God helps us deal with injustices and sin and evil in the world. It, it helps us as we, we look at the world around us and, and ourselves are appalled at the evil we see. And, and it also helps us when evil is done against us. How so? Well, think about this. If this is coming, this is the real justice. We don't need to take matters into our own hands. No, no, look, there's a place for using the governing authorities. If somebody steals your car or breaks in your house, you can report it to police and hope that the police catch the perpetrator. I'm not talking about that. But, but if somebody sins against you or somebody has, has hurt you in some way, we need not take our anger out on others ourselves. We need not become bitter. We need not become revengeful. We need not be stuck in despair at the evil in the world around us, even the evil done to us. Why? Because God promises to deal with it, and God will deal with it in a way much more severe than we ever could or would ever even want to in most cases. Romans 12 is helpful here on this point that I'm making. Romans 12, 17 through 19, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. 
Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Our passage today shows us that, that God promises to repay, that vengeance is his. So you can rest in God's justice. You can rest in the reality that his righteous wrath is coming. Let God deal with it. He promises he will. You don't need to take matters into your own hands. You don't need to hold on to grudges. You don't need to build up resentments. You don't need to be filled with bitterness. God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. And this day is coming in the future. The second heading in our passage this morning related to God's steadfast love is the past in verses 7 through 14. Now, as we come to verse 7, it might seem like a pretty extreme shift from wrath to love. And in some ways, there is a shift here. But look, like I just said, the two go together. And I've connected this first part of the future in the first six verses of the wrath of God coming on the day of vengeance for those who reject God. It's something that helps us to actually appreciate what God has done for those who've received his love. God's steadfast love in the past is remembered here. And and there's this incredible thankfulness for it. Because look, if if, if we come to realize, gosh, look at at what I could face apart from God's steadfast love, you might appreciate your salvation and the steadfast love God gives you all the more, right? When you hear about the wine press of the wrath of God. But let's again go back to chapter 62, verse 6 and 7 of this this illustration of the watchman. We saw last week that God prompts people to pray for the fulfillment of his mission and purposes of salvation. And again, he describes it as watchmen on the walls. And a phrase is used there related to the watchman praying as people who put the Lord in remembrance And I mentioned that week that that's connected with prayer. That's a way of talking about praying um, for God's purposes there in that passage. Their praying is associated with remembering the Lord, okay? So in that context, and we've got watchmen on the wall, now here in chapter 63, verse 7, this watchman who puts the Lord in remembrance is recounting or remembering, if you will, the steadfast love of the Lord. So I think we have here one of the watchmen who's speaking again. Maybe the same one of verses 1 through 6, but even if it's not, this watchman is, is, is putting the Lord in remembrance. He's remembering, he's reflecting on, specifically we're told here, God's steadfast love. He remembers all the reasons to praise God for his steadfast love. He remembers all that the Lord has granted and given them as part of his steadfast love. He remembers the goodness and compassion of God that's connected to his steadfast love. And and notice in verse 7 how steadfast love is sort of bookending, you know, uh, or packaging in the beginning and the end of verse 7, this introductory verse to this next section, verses 7 through 14. And steadfast love is repeated at the front and at the back, and it kind of packages it and kind of tells us steadfast love is connected thematically here with with the theme of this section and really the the chapter in large part. And then we come to verses 8 and 9, which continue with some specific examples of God's steadfast love in the past. The watchman put in remembrance is doing some remembering. Verse 8, he says, God had said... He's reflecting on what God had said in the past. Surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. And what the watchman is doing is reflecting on the the early days of God making his people be called his people. He's reflecting on how God chose his people. And we certainly can think of the covenants made all the way back to Abraham and Isaac, but an allusion is also being made to the early days of the people of God in the Exodus when God promises deliverance from Egypt, even prior to the Exodus, as you know, he's beginning the uh, interaction with Moses, and then he's eventually the plagues, and eventually the deliverance out of Egypt. But in, in Exodus chapter 6, verse 7, listen to what God says. God says, I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. 
what we see in Exodus 6, 7 is just one example where God says, I'm going to be your savior. I'm going to deliver you from Egypt. You're going to be my people. I'm going to be your God. So the watchman is reflecting and remembering of this event. And, and, and also how God would then give his people his law, his standards, his will, his commandments. And as God gave them those principles to live by, with an expect, there was an expectation that they were to live by. They were to obey. And, and if they did, there were blessings. If they didn't, there were consequences. Verse 9, they failed, and their failures grieved God. But they also faced incredible afflictions and suffering, and God was grieved. It pained him. Now, there were afflictions in Egypt, yes, prior to their deliverance from it, but there are also many times after their deliverance from Egypt where their afflictions that they faced were often connected to their own sinfulness. They were results of their sin. But God was again and again slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. God continued to show love, compassion, mercy, and forgiveness. The angel of God's presence saved them, it says. In God's love and pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up. He carried them all the days of old. God himself intervened. His very presence was with his people. It was near to them, revealing himself to his people even as they were brought out of Egypt and then on their journey towards the promised land, they were led by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Very symbolic and, and real, real literally God's presence with his people guiding them and leading them. Again, showing them his steadfast love. But, verse 10, despite all this, his people rebelled. And in their rebellion, in their sin, they grieved God's Holy Spirit. Therefore, God turned to be their enemy, not permanently necessarily, but in the sense that he acted, as verse 10 says, to fight then against him. And what that means is God brought about corrective consequences. Even in this corrective consequences, even in his discipline out of love for them throughout their history, whether it be the wilderness wanderings in the desert, the defeats from their enemies in battle, and many other corrective judgments, God remembered his steadfast love. Verse 11 says, God remembered the days of old of Moses and his people. And this is a reference to how he saved and delivered them and called a people to himself. God put the Holy Spirit in their very midst, a mark of his presence with them. God parted the sea, bringing his people through and then justly judging their enemies as the sea came down on Pharaoh's armies. So verse 12 tells us it was God's glorious arm that brought about the deliverance, the salvation from Egypt in the time of Moses. God divided the waters before them. He brought his people through their depths and he made for himself an everlasting name. Like a horse in the desert, his people did not stumble. God continually provided for them. They had food, they had protection, they had God's guidance, the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. Verse 14 the, like livestock that go into the valley, the Spirit of the Lord gave his people rest. They were led through the wilderness into God's rest, which is a term that is connected with the land that God gives them. And in being rightly related to God, it's connected with being rightly related to him. And so God made himself a glorious name as he saved his people and as he accomplishes his purposes of that salvation for his people all out of his steadfast love. So the remembering here that this watchman is doing, this recounting of God's work in the past, is all, are all ways of expressing thanks to God for his steadfast love. And there's an undeserved grace that you can't miss here that is connected to the steadfast love because his people failed at times. All, all that God did in the past, though, with the exodus from Egypt being an example, shows God's steadfast love and his salvation. But here's the thing, the past also points to and provides hope for the future. Because if God showed steadfast love in such incredible ways, like he did in the days of Moses during the exodus, he will surely all the more continue to show his steadfast love in the future, perhaps in even greater ways. That's what the watchman is expressing here. 
If God saved his people, delivering them from Egypt, how much more will he save them from the day of vengeance and the righteous wrath that is to come that was depicted in verses one through six? You see, the remembrance of the past points towards promises of the same steadfast love and an even greater salvation to come in the future. A salvation that's not from the captivity and slavery of Egypt, but a salvation that is from the captivity and slavery of our own sin. A new exodus to a new promised land to a new heavens and a new earth with a new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven out of God, as Revelation says, for all the true people of God who are rightly related to him. What you and I can clearly see in this section of this passage in verses 7 through 14 is how important it is for us to remember God's steadfast love in the past. And yes, I I want you to think about the history of God's steadfast love. Yes, that's why God gives us these stories, these truths, these historical accounts in his word so we can remember how God worked in the past with his people, absolutely. But in remembering God's steadfast love, let's also not be amidst to to not also personalize it a little bit. Here's what I mean. And, and, And though our lives are relatively brief compared to the history of God's salvation, Even if you're an elderly person here today, your your life is a relatively brief moment compared to the history of God's journey with his people. But in your own journey, in your own lifetime, have you not experienced God's steadfast love? Have you not seen instances where God has worked in your life and shown you his steadfast love? And we ought to remember that too. Again and again, I would argue he likely has. Most of all, remember the ultimate demonstration of God's steadfast love for you is through Jesus. Jesus in his suffering and death absorbed the righteous wrath of God. He took the cup of wrath for you and he drank it down so that God's justice would be poured out, yes, to consistent with his goodness and his righteousness and his holiness. Because if God didn't exercise a just punishment, we couldn't call him good. But instead of that being poured out on you and me, Jesus takes that for us, all because of his steadfast love. And that is how, with his holy arm, with his mighty arm, with the mighty one to save, indeed himself does it, to spare us from sin and from the day of vengeance, and instead to give us the year of redemption and eternal salvation. God's steadfast love is constant, it's continual, it's committed, it's covenantal, and it's complete. Nothing can separate you from this love, and there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So are you in Christ Jesus? Have you received God's steadfast love for you through Christ Jesus? Has this steadfast love from God changed your life? And is it continuing to change your life? If you know Jesus, if you have received his love, remember it. And remember what it has spared you from. And let it transform your lives forevermore. Let's pray. Lord, your love is beyond our comprehension. As high as the heavens are above the earth, how great is your steadfast love, your loving kindness towards those who fear you. And as far as east is from west, you've removed our transgressions from us through Jesus because you've paid it in full for us. No one else could save us. So you saved us. You alone can save us. You are the mighty one to save, and we thank you. God, help us to be in remembrance, to have a heart of thanksgiving, to not forget your incredible love for us, and may your love compel us 
to not just live for ourselves, but to live for him who died and rose again on our behalf. God, let us be about telling others about this good news, the good news of you sparing us from what we deserve, telling people what is available to them of the steadfast love in God that's given to them by your grace. And again, let the incredible love that you've lavished on us to call us children of God just compel us all the more to love and live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. The worship team, come on up, and if you're able to stand, will you stand with us for one final song of worship?